Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Astro Show, a place to be if you're curious about the cosmos. I'm your host, Dr. Sam, the founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing. Here, you can pick the brains of astrophysicists, get advice from an aerospace doctor, learn about what scientists have to say about life, and find out what's going on up above your head all in the same place. So thank you for joining us this evening, and we hope you join us every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. And you can chat your questions on Twitch and YouTube, and we would love to hear from you. On this week's show, we have Dr. Scott Gowdy, the Thomas Jefferson Professor for Discovery and Space Exploration in the Department of Astronomy at Ohio State University. Dr. Gowdy specializes in the discovery and characterization of exosolar planets and has been involved with the discovery of nearly two dozen of them. We will hear all about that from Dr. Gowdy later this evening, uh, but before that happens, let's welcome our co-stars. First, host of her own YouTube show, Nora's Guide to the Galaxy, it's Dr. Nora Bailey. Hi. Hey, Nora. Great to have you with us. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Next, aerospace doctor and founder of Orbital Biodesign, it's Dr. Danny Carroll. Hey, everybody. Good to see hey, you. Danny. Thanks for being here. And last but certainly not least, astronomer and data visualization engineer at the Adler Planetarium, it's Dr. Lauren Corleys. Hello. Hey, Lauren. And uh, our special guest for this evening from Ohio State University, Dr. Scott Gowdy. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being here, Scott. We really appreciate of course, it. Of course, having me. All right, let's get the slide deck up for tonight. Here we are. And uh, as we start every show, we're going to start with Astro Advice. Oh, and at first I welcome to Scott um, <laughs> for ever being here. And the next part of the show that we always start with, Astro Advice. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to read the quotation, and uh, then I'll give you four different possibilities of who actually said it. So the quotation for this evening is, Excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. So your four opportunities... Uh, of who said that are uh, Marie Maynard Daly, uh, May Carol Jemison, Charles Drew, and Edward Boucher. So um, Marie um, Daly, or Daly, uh, American biochemist, uh, and the first African-American woman in the United States to earn a PhD in chemistry, uh, among other things, had an interest in nuclear proteins and developed methods for the um, fractation, fractation of uh, nuclear material and determination of its composition. Uh, Watson and Crick gave her uh, major kudos uh, for their discovery or theft uh, of the structure of DNA. <laughs> uh, we can uh, we can talk more about that later. Uh, next, uh, Mae Jemison, uh, American engineer, physician, former NASA astronaut, um, first African-American woman to travel into space uh, on board Space Shuttle Endeavor. Option C, uh, Charles Drew, uh, American surgeon and medical researcher, um, best known for his work in developing um, innovations with the field of blood transfusions and storage, um, particularly around the time of World War II. Um, shortly thereafter, um, the Army U.S. Army and Navy ruled that uh, the blood of African Americans would only be accepted and stored separately. Uh, Drew um, vehemently protested uh, the practice of racial segregation of blood donation and resigned his post um, running um, the U.S. Army and Navy blood bank the following year. <clears throat> job, Dr. Drew. And fourth, D. Um, Edward Boucher, American physicist and educator, uh, completed his dissertation in physics at Yale University in 1876, making him among the first 20 Americans to receive a PhD in physics and only the sixth 
to receive it from Yale. Um, he um, spent 14 years holding a variety of academic jobs around the country in administrative instructional capacities um, and um, um, was uh, involved with um, the Institute for Colored Youth, now um, um, the Cheney uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, so did a lot of amazing things um, very, very early on in this country's history in physics. So those are your four options. Once again, the quotation is, excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. So what say you, co-stars? And Scott, what, what do you think? Don't all jump at once. Okay, uh, we got one, one vote for uh, Charles Drew from Dr. Danny. I second that. Okay. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> so, so Dr. Lauren and uh, Dr. Scott are all going in, uh, doubling down on Charles Drew. Uh, Nora, what do you think? No, I'm gonna break break the mold here. I'm gonna go with D. Gonna okay. Go with and one Maybe vote. I should listen to the high mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you should have Nora. It, it is indeed <laughs> Charles Drew. Were you just helping us out there, Nora, keeping things real? What can I say? I'm just some uh, team player. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got uh, one point for uh, for Scott, Danny, and Lauren. Nora, you're going to catch everybody once we get to uh, the news trivia quiz, I have no doubt. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do, what do you all think about this quotation? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it's a little naive, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Say more, Scott. Say more. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I think that we're all faced with operating within the structures that we are uh, that we're operating in, you know, and uh, and it's easy to say that you can just lift yourself up by the bootstraps without having to, you know, refer to the, the structures that you're embedded in. But it just doesn't really work that way. It's really hard to, to go beyond the structures that you're in. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you. I think you have to work for it. Yeah, I, think, I was thinking along the same lines, not to sound like too cynical, but, <laughs> you know, it would be nice if that were true. But um, I guess I would say that excellence of performance can help transcend artificial barriers created by man, but will is uh, is a strong word there. <laughs> yeah, maybe if there was like a, a, a will eventually or can eventually, but um, yeah. Well, I don't think they're artificial, right? Like humans have created these barriers, but they're not artificial in any way, right? Like they're real barriers that you have to face. And it's also like who defines and judges excellence. And that's defined and judged differently depending on what you look like is just a reality of the world that we live in. And so this whole idea, like you can be as excellent as you want, but you're never going to maybe even be recognized for that as I think Dr. Daly would say, or Miss Daly. But did she have a, I forgot her name. I, you know, I will say the point I'm making. <laughs> yeah. I will say this: this quote definitely sounded like it was said by a white man. <laughs> Agreed. That's why I picked C. <laughs> yeah, what an interesting coincidence, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he he definitely meant well um, in saying this, but I don't think he took any DEI classes. Unfortunately, <laughs> that was kind of my my impression. But I think all that being said, like anyone can be excellent in what they're doing, right? And so there is still that aspect of it, but it's all functioning in the world that we live in. And so mm -hmm. we all keep trying the best that we can, but it's not, well, and not easy also, or a given. <laughs> yeah, there's also that thought that and I, I'm going to butcher this quote, but it's something I think it was by Einstein, or at least it was attributed to Einstein about a fish that's judged by its ability to climb a tree is going to go its entire life thinking it's stupid or something to that effect, right? And so it's maybe not like directly pertinent to this quote, but it's I think along those lines that, yeah, whoever said that um, it I think partly depends on how excellence is even defined or judged in the first place, right? What the what the threshold is or what the qualities are. Agreed. Yeah, and Lauren, I, I really appreciate what you mentioned about. The, the difference between the real barriers that are in place 
based on artificial differences, right? I, I think that um, could have been phrased a little bit differently in this quotation, but um, certainly important, this, important to make that yeah. distinction. I would say this this comes from someone that has not faced a lot of adversity and has said comes from a system of privilege. That would that's what it seems like to me. Yep. Um, but I mean, I I think that you know, despite you know his lack of articulating this from a a sound DEI perspective, um, I think in action he was in the right place. I mean, I, I think his decision to resign as director of the blood bank based on the army's decision to segregate blood is quite noble. And so I, I think his heart was in the right place. Um, maybe just needed um, a broader perspective and a bit of education, as we all do. Any other thoughts? All right. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, move right along to Astro 365, this day in astrophysics history. So on this day in 1990, um, the $2.5 billion Hubble Space Telescope was deployed um, from Space Shuttle Discovery uh, in orbit, about 381 miles above the Earth. Um, time of launch was uh, seven years behind schedule. Uh, nearly $2 billion over budget, but uh, a little than a month later, it produced um, the first of about 1.4 million images taken through the scope since then. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, some of you will remember, those first images didn't come out that great. Um, <laughs> there was some, some figuring problems uh, in the curvature of the primary mirror, and it didn't focus correctly. Uh, so some corrective optics had to be installed um, and later were installed in all the new instruments that were sent up uh, at an initial cost of another uh, $80 million. So it, it wasn't a cheap instrument, um, but the amount of research that's been done with the Hubble Space Telescope, in my humble opinion, has made it worth every cent. Um, truly one of the most incredible um, scientific instruments ever, cre ever created, uh, maybe topped now by uh, the newest addition to the Space Telescope line, the telescope formerly known as the James Webb Space Telescope that we are referring to at Wyoming Stargazing as the Margaret Burbage Space Telescope. So uh, that's what happened in 1990 on this day. And now it is time for everybody's favorite part of the Astro Show, the Astronomy News Trivia quiz. Co-stars, are you ready? <laughs> all right. I was pumped up. All right, here we go. Remember, this is all lightning round, so just shout out the answer as soon as you get it. That was not supposed to be first. Oh, yeah, that was actually, I, that was supposed to be first. Sorry. Uh, this <laughs> picture of, of uh, the Hubble Space Telescope separating from um, Space Shuttle Endeavor. So, so I meant to show you that first. My apologies. Okay, now on to the news trivia quiz. Here we go. Which university is sending America's first robotic lunar rover to the moon this May, beating NASA by the punch by about a year? Oh, um, like University of Kentucky or University of Louisville? Or, uh, Not quite. Oh, I, I read something about this. It's a big one. <laughs> one of the big universities. They were, uh, this uh, family was was big in New York. Johns Hopkins? Not Johns Hopkins. Another another huge name in New York. There's a hall named after yeah. them. Columbia? There's a what? There's a hall in New York City named after them. Oh. Carnegie? Carnegie! Carnegie, <laughs> <laughs> Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> yeah, that sounds yeah. right. So, oh, oh, nice one, Nora. <laughs> there you go. We're all tied up. I definitely up. knew that. <laughs> we're, all, we're all tied up. One point to one point to one. So, um, so yeah, students and uh, professors at Carnegie uh, Mellon have been making this rover um, for several years, and it's uh, it's going to get launched to the moon, and hopefully, will be the first operational uh, robotic lunar rover. And it's like the size of like a big toaster oven. It's a cute little bugger, um, but. Yeah, um, very exciting stuff. And I love that they're they're beating NASA by a year. 
All right, uh, getting back to uh, Rosalind Franklin uh, and her discovery of the double helix structure of DNA, uh, the European Space Agency's Rosalind Franklin rover, also known as ExoMars rover, uh, will launch to Mars in 2028 on a mission to do what? Sample soil. Sample soil, but uh, one specific thing about what it will do better than any other lander on Mars, specifically with the soil. Maybe measure water content? I don't know. You're on the right track. Look for organics. Look for organics, and it's going to drill deeper than ever before. It's going down six feet. Yeah. So I feel like it's like half a point for Danny and half a point for Scott there. You both got you both got parts of that. Nicely done. But yeah, it's um, it will, uh, there's, there's going to be a, um, a an orbiter and then a lander. And um, yeah, supposedly it'll get down six feet in an area where there is believed to have been um, ancient lakes and hopefully we'll find evidence of life. Uh, so a very fitting that it will be looking for the building blocks of life and will be called the Rosalind Franklin Rover. Nicely done, ESA, nicely done. All right, moving on. What went wrong with the Starship launch? <laughs> Besides it exploding. <laughs> yeah, we're going to give that to you. <laughs> That's basically what uh, SpaceX said. Uh, they said it was a rapid, unscheduled disassembly, <laughs> aka an explosion. <laughs> um, yep, nicely done, guys. Uh, apparently, uh, heralded as a partial success, they learned a lot uh, of what not to do. And so uh, the engineers are back to the drawing board and hopefully we'll have a um, orbital test flight sometime in the upcoming months or a year. Uh, we're going to give that one to you, Lauren. So you have the lead now with two points. Here we go. A team of oceanographers has mapped 19,000 previously unknown undersea volcanoes in the world's oceans. What kind of data did they use to make those discoveries? Um, maybe from drones. I have a friend who's not mapping drones. drones so. oh. uh, sonar? They use radar satellite data. Indeed. Mm. Nicely done, Scott. All right, so now Scott has a lead. Wait, um, radar is not sonar. <laughs> oh, that, oh, sorry, you said sonar. I said sonar, not radar. I really wanted you to say radar. <laughs> That's my bad. <laughs> Just to clarify for our viewers, not because uh, I don't think Scott deserves the point. <laughs> uh, Nora, would you would you please tell everybody the difference between sonar and um, and radar? Yeah, I mean it's the same concept, right? You're sending out a signal and then you're detecting the return concept. But sonar uses sound waves and radar uses radio waves. Radio waves, yeah. So they they did use radio for this, uh, not not sound waves. Thank you for that, and um, yeah, I'll pay better attention. Uh, but here's the map, uh, 19,000 previously unknown undersea volcanoes. Um, not bad. Here's a couple of the, the volcanoes there. Um, all right, here we go. Next question. In a new series of papers um, of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, the ACT collaboration, uh, have used background light from the CMB, uh, to create a new map of dark matter distribution. Uh, what theory um, did it confirm? Lambda CDM? Well, uh, it's, it's nothing, the... nothing new, actually. I had, uh, I had changed the wording on this. Somebody changed it back. Uh, the, it's supposed to be, uh, what theory did they confirm again? That's been confirmed Lots and lots of times. General relativity? General relativity. <laughs> Can never confirm it too many times. <laughs> like Lambda CDM? Confirmed <laughs> <Like that. laughs> Einstein's general theory of relativity again. Yep. So another point for Nora. Um, so let's see. I think uh, do you already do you have two points, Nora? Is that three or are you at two now? I think I'm at two now. Okay, so tie with Lauren um, for two points. There's the new map. Uh, 
Speaking of Einstein, uh, a new look at Einstein rings around distant galaxies. Uh, not around distant galaxies, but actually in quasars. Um, uh, published in Nature, uh, suggests what particle model is a likely candidate for dark matter? Axions. Axions! <laughs> yeah! I am pretty stoked about that. Uh, basically, there are two different possibilities. You got WIMPs, uh, weakly interacting massive particles, or axions. Um, but do, this new data suggests that axions are actually... Um, potentially the particle that contributes most of the dark matter in the universe. Um, we don't know yet, but um, this is one piece of evidence for axions. Sorry. And, uh, oh, what's that? I've never heard of an axion before. What is the, what are the characteristics of it and how does that differ from a wimp? That is a great question. Um, so let's see, uh, I will start this out and then uh, the rest of you can help me out here. Uh, so, so <laughs> WIMPs uh, include a whole like group of, um, of particles that we know to exist, um, but um, we don't, um, but they don't uh, interact uh, much with, um, with light. So we don't see them. Uh, whereas axions are, are theoretical. We don't actually know whether axions exist or not. Um, they're theorized particles, not part of the standard model, um, but um, this evidence suggests that they, they might actually exist. Um, I, believe, I believe they're also more massive than typical wimp, wimp particle. Yeah, they're, they're bigger particles. Yep, more massive. Anybody else wanna fill in any more gaps there? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. And that, was that Nora who said axions? Mm -hmm. All right. So three points for Nora. She's got the lead. All right. Here we go. Uh, which new threat to planetary life has NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory discovered? Flares. Uh, not just flares, but uh, specifically... Uh, um, radiation from uh, another type of solar event. Oh. Much, much bigger than a flare. Coronal mass ejection? You're, you're on the right track. Even bigger. Way bigger, in fact. Like the whole star. Star formation? A supernova? A supernova! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just keep guessing. <laughs> okay, so we already knew this is, you know, problematic for planets that are close to their stars that go supernova, duh. Uh, it turns out that it's even a bigger problem than we knew of for planets at least 160 light years away. Um, so, so new wow. research on the X-rays that are released um, from supernovae uh, suggests that um, planets in other star systems, um, as much as 160 light years away, um, could actually have um, life-ending um, catastrophic um, fallout from supernovae. Well, that doesn't um, sound very fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Based on just the X-ray radiation, I mean, you, you've also got like just the whole band of um, radiation that gets released if you're close. And then you've got the charged particles that come several years later. But yeah, it turns out you can just get cooked by the x-rays um, really, really far away. So um, problematic. Um, but uh, Nora, nice job again. That's four points for Nora. We only <laughs> have three more questions. So um, if anyone's going to overtake Nora, you better, uh, you better get these ones. Here we go. Uh, which telescope, and this is not a trick question, by the way, which telescope launched on a scientific superpressure balloon on April 16th uh, captured its first uh, research images of the Tarantula Nebula and Antenna Galaxies? Is this the Spider Telescope? So close. <sighs> Think about not a trick question. Tarantula telescope. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, you're on the right track, actually. It's, it's, it really is that simple. <laughs> Arachnid. 
<laughs> I like the way you're thinking, Danny. It, it was in the question. Um, it's something with the balloon? It's something with the balloon, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should know this. It's it's just the super pressure balloon imaging telescope. <laughs> it's, called, it's called short super bit. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I had no idea this thing even existed. It was launched in New Zealand. I mean, huge, uh, huge high altitude super pressure balloon. I mean, pretty cool. That's awesome. uh, so this is the one that, that China uses as a spy balloon for to shame. This was a serious, um, huge balloon. And it, um, yeah, it lifted this telescope up. And it's, um, its main purpose actually is to, um, to chart a uh, weak a gravitational um, lensing. Um, and so it's looking at um, the, um, the gravitational effect that these objects have on the space around them. This, so this super pressure balloons are a relatively new technology, very promising. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I, I had no idea they even existed um, before seeing this, um, this news bit, so. What's the, uh, like, Oh, go ahead. Super pressure. I don't. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this up later because I'm curious about the technology. Yeah, I, I just read a little bit about it. Let me let me pull this up again. Um, I, I think, think they're it, not equilibrium with the atmosphere, so they're they're actually overpressured, and that allows them to have more stability. Yeah, and they go high. We're talking like 108,000 feet um, above mm -hmm. Earth's surface. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the size of it is um, is kind of incredible. Um, how big did it actually get when they launched it? Um, it was, oh, I can't find it now. But there are some cool pictures on the NASA website of this thing taken off. Um, anyways, check it out. Yeah, 18.8 .8 million cubic feet. That's how big the balloon was. 18.8 oh. .8 million cubic feet is a big balloon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> perfect for birthday party celebrations. Okay, uh, two more questions. Here we go. Uh, which retired solar energy imaging spacecraft re-entered re -entered the atmosphere last week after 21 years in space? I never heard so of it. By the way, Soho. It wasn't Soho. Mm -hmm. I remember reading about the reentry, but I can't remember what the which one it was. <laughs> it was entered right on schedule over the Sahara Desert. Um, apparently, mostly broke up. Um, some pieces may have hit, but not much. Mm. Yeah, I, I had never heard of this. Um, it is the Reuven Remity High Energy Solar Spectroscopic Imager, RISI, for short. That's an artist impression. Okay, one last question. Here we go. What agency successfully launched the PSLV C55 um, to place two Singaporean satellites into orbit um, for Earth observation last week? CNSA? It wasn't, it wasn't Singapore. No, I was said it the NSA. No, that was them. Okay. JAXA. JAXA. Yeah. What's that? JAXA. I think she and I were both guessing. It wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't JAXA. You're. You're. Uh, you're. You're. You're on the right continent. The Chinese Space Agency. It was not China. Hmm. It was Taiwan? No. It was not but, Taiwan. Yeah. It was the Indian Space Research oh. Organization, ISRO. They, they apparently go. have a great track record of, um, of launching these um, specific rockets with payloads. Oh. All right, I think Nora is our astronomy <laughs> news trivia champion this week. From oh. guessing. <laughs> this is all about I guessing. Did and you, did, you did great. You all did great. Um, nicely done as always. And uh, that brings us on to what's up, Dr. Sam. 
If you missed it, there was an amazing show of Aurora Borealis and Northern Lights uh, a couple nights ago. Some of the best displays we have had in Jackson um, in about 15 years. It was seen as far south as um, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so really big um, coronal mass ejection a few days prior that sent charged particles to interact with Earth's atmosphere. And here are some of the pictures that we got in Jackson. A uh, classic one over on the right taken by uh, Wyoming stargazing board member and stargazing leader J.R. Dalby. Um, classic silhouette of the Tetons there with uh, Northern Lights. So it was a good one. Um, we are ramping up in solar activity. Um, the prediction is that we're going to reach solar maximum in somewhere between two to four years. Uh, and so we're going to start seeing more and more uh, coronal mass ejections from the sun. And that means more and more probability of northern lights. So um, stay tuned for that and um, keep, uh, keep looking up. There's a great website called uh, Space Weather Live that you can get predictions um, for upcoming displays of northern lights. So um, you can link to that from the uh, Wyoming Stargazing website on tonight's weather forecast or just go straight to spaceweatherlive.com. All right, well, um, it is now time for our guest spot. Um, Dr. Scott Gowdy is here with us from Ohio University. Um, Scott, thanks so much for joining us. And- um, Ohio State. Ohio State. <laughs> Ohio State. The Ohio State. The Ohio State. The Ohio State. My, uh, my apologies. Don't want to get those messed up. Um, well, Scott, and thanks so much for being here. Um, we, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'd like to start all the guest spots out with um, with asking our special guests, what's the, the one question that you wish everyone would ask you, but nobody ever does? Um, so I get a lot of questions. So this was a hard one. <laughs> Um, I, the question I would like people to ask me is why should we, we the global, we human beings, fund astronomical research, given that we're basically parasites on, astro on society? <laughs> All right, Scott, why should we, as, you know, the global uh, civilization, fund this research? Um, so I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, sign that we're a civilized society that is uh, trying to better itself. Um, I think that the pursuit of knowledge is important for enriching our lives. Um, and I think that the questions that we ask ourselves as humans, um, uh, you know, philosophical questions, or other kinds of questions are deeply rooted in astronomy and, and our, our um, effort to find, you know, is there life out there? And those question. So I think it's that uh, it has, you know, almost no practical Im impact on society, but at the same time, I think it enriches our society greatly. I think that's one of the best answers I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> question. So thank you, Scott. That was, that was wonderful. Um, well, tell us a little about how you got into astronomy and, and what you're up to now in that field. So, so my, my astronomy story is uh, when I was in second grade, my uh, second grade teacher was, she was very big on Miss Eleanor Gregory. I was from a very small town in rural uh, Southern Illinois with about 4,000 people. And she gave our class the assignment to go home and memorize the name of the nine planets back when there were nine in order uh, and come back and, and you know, re repeat the names. And so I went home and my parents, I'd gotten a subscription to National Geographic, and with it came a couple of picture atlases, one of which is called Our Universe. Um, and it was a picture atlas of astronomy, but it contained all this uh, stuff about the planets, but it also contained this great chapter about what life might look like on other planets in the solar system. Um, I mean, completely preposterous things like, you know, blimp like creatures floating in Jupiter or something. But anyway, I read that book from cover to cover, and I walked right up to my parents that night and said, I'm going to be an astronomer. So, stuck with that. So, wow, that's incredible. So you were <clears throat> what, like eight eight years old, uh, in second grade, something like that. 
Yeah, something like that. Um, you know, I mean, my parents kind of patted me on the head and were like, yeah, I'm sure tomorrow you're going to say you want to be a firefighter. Or something. <laughs> More or less stuck to my guns the entire time. Um, what am I up to now? Uh, well, I'm heavily invested in NASA's next flagship astrophysics mission after the, I like to call it the uh, Jalapeno Watermelon Space Telescope. Um, <laughs> the next is the Roman the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is as a much better named after a much better person, in my personal opinion, um, and uh, she was, was the first chief astronomer of NASA. Uh, she was uh, she's called the mother of Hubble. She was instrumental in getting Hubble launched. Anyway, this is a mission that's the size of Hubble that has a hundred times the field of view and a thousand times the mapping speed of, of Hubble, and so you can map large areas of the sky very quickly or smaller areas of the sky. I'm interested in using find exoplanet by the thousands, um, sort of the next big technique after you know, we know radio velocity, we know our, uh, transits, the next big one is called microlensing, and this is going to be the, uh, the next big statistical sample of time. Combined with the Kepler Space Telescope, basically we will find all the planets in a st statistical sense that are in the galaxy. So that's what I'm really excited about right now. And surprisingly, a lot of people don't know this, Roman is less than four years from launch. Wow. Yep. I did not know that. That is yep. super cool. Yep. So, so say more about um, this technique of, of microlensing and how it's used to detect extrasolar planets. So uh, so back to Einstein. Uh, this was an idea that, came, that Einstein came up with and published in 1936. He was very reluctant to publish it because... Um, he thought it was kind of a, a, a useless uh, idea that he came that he came up with, but one of publish <laughs> it. So, uh, so the idea is that you use the gravity of an object, like a star or a planet, to magnify a background star, and so you can detect planets just by their mass rather than by their light, and that enables you to find really low mass planets and planets quite far away. Um, that are very, and the kinds of planets you find are very complementary to, say, Kepler. Um, famously, Einstein said in his article, um, there is no great chance of observing this phenomenon, but yet we've now seen it tens of thousands of times. So um, that's the technique we're going to use. Cool. So it's so it's seeing like the, the discrepancies of how the star's mass should magnify objects versus the star's mass plus the planet's mass? It so you get this nice smooth curve if you just have a star, but if you have a planet orbiting that star, you get a little deviation on top of it. Um, gotcha. So the, the deviations we look for. And you can find planets that have mass all the way down to a few times the mass of the moon with this technique. Wow. Moment. Yeah. So we'll be able to find moons around giant planets, which I just think is super cool. So. That is super cool. So what do you think? Are we going to have more, more exomoons than... Exoplanets? I don't know. It's a good question. You know, moons are very ubiquitous in our solar system, as we know, but they're they're not super massive, right? So you know, they're they're about a, a hundredth the mass of the Earth, um, and so they're right at the edge of the detectability with Roman. But if they're common, and but you know, if they're common, we'll find them. But also, you know, we have to keep in mind that every single time we've made a prediction in the field of exoplanets for how common or rare something is, we were just wrong. Um, and, you know, so every, I like to joke, every time we turn over a rock, we find an exoplanet. So why not, <laughs> why not exo moons as well? So I'm hopeful that there's going to be a lot of them out there. Yeah. And so you, you said, you know, thousands upon thousands of, um, of exoplanets. Do you, do you have a, like a, a number in your head that you think are the, the number of exoplanets per galaxy? Uh, I mean, no, I mean, no, I mean, I, when I say, you know, thousands of exoplanets discovered by Roman, you know, I don't know that answer because if I did, we wouldn't have to do the survey. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think that it's, it's quite likely that, you know, basically every star has a planet down to the mass of, you know, uh, the earth um, and even more planets that are lower mass. Um, so, you know, you, you assign one or two planets, depending on what you call a planet, to every star in the galaxy, and you're up to tens of billions of planets, you know, so they're very, they're all over the place. Nice. And so, so Roman gets launched in, in four years, you said, about four years? 
Current launch date is October 2026. And then what is the um, the anticipated um, first light date after that launch? Is it pretty quick or is there some time? <laughs> Similar to, so it's going to be at L2 where, where the okay. uh, annual watermelon space telescope is. Um, and uh, so it's the same thing. It takes six months to get out there and there's commissioning. It's not, the one thing that's very different about Roman than, than JWST is that, uh, is that uh, it? Um, it is a much simpler instrument. You know, it has a, basically a camera um, and you know three moving parts or something like that. Now, there's also a chronograph which can directly image planets. That's super complicated, but that's a test instrument uh, to detect, test our technology for the next flagship mission after Roman by NASA Astrophysics, which is the Hubble World Observatory, which is also something I've spent a lot of time working on over the last ten years. Very cool. Um, so we're, we're thinking by, so four years, so, so 20, 2027, 2028. Yeah. So the, and the data is all going to be, uh, publicly available immediately. I'm working, I just put in a proposal to work with a bunch of people to develop tools that allow any random graduate student at any uh, university all over the world to just take the tools, download the data and find planets by themselves. My dream wow. is someone that as they basically never done microlensing before in their life, well, some graduate student is going to find the first planet with uh, microlensing with Roman. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I I remember probably in the, it must have been like the early 90s when SETI put out that screensaver where you could uh, right. analyze their, their data and hopefully, you know, find alien signals. So I, I love the idea of grad students. Um, using this data to um, yeah we, we have we have great plans for citizen science projects as well so that people can just download the light curves and look through them and try to find the deviations from planets after they get like a training tutorial and things like that very much in the line, same line as planet hunters with kepler so oh very cool yeah i remember that one too yeah awesome um so, so you're working on these um telescopes but you also uh, teach some classes right <laughs> yeah, I just finished this uh, semester last week, actually. Oh, nice. Well, congrats on that. Thanks. Um, just to, like general intro to astronomy classes or a wide range of things? So the last few years I've been teaching the introductory first to astronomy for uh, astronomy and astrophysics majors, which is by far my favorite course to teach because they're they're super engaged and they really, you know, a lot of them want to go on to be astronomers and go to graduate school. And, um, and actually, this is happening all over the country, but the number of undergraduate majors in astronomy and astrophysics is is growing very rapidly and mm -hmm. quintupled in the last 12 years or something like that. So we have wow. 100, 180 undergraduates or roughly that uh, in majors in astronomy and astrophysics at Ohio State University. And that number is repeated in University of Washington and University of Michigan and other large universities like that. Wow, that is so cool. What do you yep. what do you attribute that huge growth to? So, you know, I have I have lots of ideas. We're trying to figure it out because it's, it's hard to be sustainable with that kind of growth to do yeah. you know, correctly. And I mean, you might even notice this, but, you know, I don't know if anyone else has noticed the number of people walking around with NASA T-shirts, especially young kids is just way larger now than it was 10 years ago, as far as I can tell. But I think that um, if I, my best guess is, and I'd love to hear people's input on this, is that um, is that the current generation that are, you know, coming into college um, basically don't feel the pressure to be doctors or lawyers or whatever, because the this version of success that was, you know, sort of implanted in me growing up is no longer considered necessarily the path to success. So people are doing what they really want to do. And I think mm -hmm. a large, large fraction of people, not a large fraction, a significant fraction of people wanted to do astronomy in my generation, but just didn't think it was a practical thing to do. And so now we're, we're in a generation of, of, of students that are basically like, no, I'm going to do what I want to do, not what, you know, I'm supposed to do. Wow. So we, we were all just closeted astronomers. <laughs> It'd be that the number of times I meet people on like planes or something and they say, oh, I wanted to be an astronomer, but the math was too, or, you know, I didn't think I would make any money or, you know, it's very common. Huh. Um, that's, that's really interesting. I, I wouldn't, 
I did not anticipate you saying that, but um, yeah, it totally makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I'm like, I've definitely noticed just like a growing interest in, in learning about astronomy, just with the, like the growth of the organization that, that I run. Um, and I've attributed that to like, you know, quite frankly, like the amazing PR job that NASA does and like getting the word out about what's, you know, happening, um, you know, within, you know, you know, NASA funded programs, but just like, you know, stuff like SpaceX and, um, you know, the, the remake of the cosmos, um, and, and those kinds of things. But, huh. Yeah. I hadn't thought about how, um, how success is measured differently and how that could have just kind of like opened up the gates for folks to do what they really are passionate about. I, I like that idea. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that it's, uh, it's the, the main contributing factor, but it's, it's something that I think is a real change in our society that would contribute. Very cool. Um, co-stars, do you have any other things to add to this, this growing popularity of, uh, astronomy? I do. Well, oh, go ahead, Nora. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say in, in regards to specifically like majors and everything, I think part of that is just the increasing specialization because astronomy used to often get lumped in, like you wouldn't have a specific astronomy major. You'd be a physics major and you might study astronomy or whatever. And now as, as astronomy as a field continues to grow, like every other field, you get more specialized. And I think now there's just so much to do that's specific to astronomy or astrophysics that it kind of stands alone a bit more on it as a field. In my mind also, I agree with, with all the, that you guys have said. And I mean, obviously my background is a little bit different than pretty much anybody else in this uh, group, but that being that I did go into medicine, Scott, um, but I think there's an, an increased awareness from what I can tell, kind of like what you were saying, Sam, I think there's an increased awareness, you know, of all things space related. Um, I don't know if that's a function of NASA's PR job or of all the commercial space stuff that's just boomed over the last five to 10 years. Um, but, you know, and then I can see what you mean also, Scott, about there being like a greater sense of agency among folks. And I say this in part also because, so I went into medicine and then while I was like in the middle of my surgery residency, I actually took some research time, which is a very normal thing to do and ended up actually getting a couple master's degrees in aerospace engineering, which seems completely like polar opposites, but there, you know, there's a way to weave them together, which is what I'm doing now. And I hear more and more nowadays of people saying, oh yeah, you know, I took this one thing that I'm really interested in and this other thing that I'm really interested in and I put them together. So I hear, you know, I hear more of that now, which maybe is a combination of all of these factors, but anyway, pretty cool regardless. So. Lauren, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just sitting here thinking it's interesting to me because when I, so I was a physics major because there was no astronomy, but people would always say to me, and even now when I tell them what I do, like, oh, that was really cool, but it was always too hard. Like that's always what people say is like, it was just too hard. I couldn't do it. And so I'm interested in wondering like what shifted about that. Cause like, obviously the astronomy that you're teaching at that level hasn't changed. It's still hard, <laughs> but what's making people either more willing to try or stick with it. Like, is there something that's changed about the department, the way it teaches, the culture of astronomy maybe has shifted enough to where people feel more comfortable with it being hard and that like trying, that's what I'm sitting here thinking about. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So, you know, one of the things that has been a culture change in astronomy, and I, I will admit we have a long way to go, is to get away from the, um, <clears throat> you know, the extremely, uh, you know, genius syndrome, you have to be a genius to do astronomy, and the kind of toxic masculinity of hyper competitiveness, right? We're trying to get away from that so that uh, so that people can feel like they have a physics or astronomy identity. Uh, even if they aren't, they don't see themselves reflected in their professors like me, who are just you know old guys. Um, so I think that that probably is contributing to just lowering the potential barrier for yeah. people to get involved in astronomy and in taking away this stigma, this idea that you have to be this uber genius. I'm not a genius, trust me. <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, so. Uh, well, I so am. That's a <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it was interesting because that was the big thing for a while. It was like, oh, I'm undecided, even though I had decided because it was just too scary to admit that like, oh, I'm going to be a physics major and like having to make that identity shift was challenging when there was 
almost no support for it. So having departments and professors indicating that clearly from the beginning, I think would increase your number of majors a lot. So. Well, I uh, have to say that I'm I'm excited about that trend, regardless of, uh, of why it's happening. I, I think the more people who are learning about the universe, the, the better our chances as a society of, of actually making it through whatever uh, pinch points might be facing us in the future. Right? I think that cosmic perspective is really, really important. Um, well, Scott, we just have um, a few more minutes left, um, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear um, anything else you um, you want to share with us about your your path through um, astronomy. Um, you know, either you know uh, as an adolescent when you were getting into the field, or um, professionally as you've experienced it. And any you know words of wisdom you you have for uh, folks watching or uh, future. Um, astrophysicists so one thing that i would uh, i've been thinking about a lot lately um, because of the way my path ended up was you know i started off just doing pure research um but i got you know kind of i kind of got uh, uh dragged into uh, what i call astropolitics which is the you know <clears throat> you know po policy making and and how do we get these missions prioritized and how do we get them built <clears throat> and i've come to um come to think of this as, you know, uh, a lot of times I, I hear from people that they think that these missions are just created by, you know, a few old white guys sitting at the pinnacle of their ivory towers in Yale, Harvard, and Princeton that decide this is what we're going to do. But it actually doesn't work that way, right? We have these things called decadal surveys that involve a large fraction of the astronomy population and increasingly younger people as well that get together and try to prioritize these things. And, and these telescopes are not just, you know, getting data for increasingly not just getting data for astronomers to publish papers and tell them, tell results of, of those papers to other astronomers. They're really seeding that back to the public and, and sharing that knowledge it should be. <clears throat> and so more and more, I think, um, there are opportunities for younger people to get involved in the astropolitics, the politics of of making space happen, making space research happen. And um, and so the, the the kind of phrase I keep coming back to is these are telescopes for the people, hmm. uh, not, not for the astronomers. So uh, that's, a, that's an idea that I'm really working on trying to socialize as much as I can, that these are telescopes are not just for people like me, they really are for everyone. That's really cool. I, I love that idea of telescopes for the people. Um, if you have some ideas of how Wyoming stargazing can help get the word out about that, we would love to, to help with that. I, I think that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll think about that. Thank yeah, uh, so it's a really cool idea. Um, I think that would resonate with folks too. Um, well, thank you for that. Any um, any words of wisdom for, um, for budding astrophysicists beyond um, how they might get involved in, um, in astropolitics? Oh, I mean, I think just generalizing what I just said, you know, there is a lot of different ways you're involved in astronomy. So if it's a, something that you like, you know, you don't have to be an expert in GR, you know, you don't have to do theoretical astrophysics. You don't have to necessarily go to telescopes. You know, there's there's many, many ways to participate in the in the science and the study and the, the culture of astronomy from, you know, like it's things like being being on the on Capitol Hill to try to make sure these things happen to being just an engaged teacher at a small liberal arts college that you're giving undergraduates research opportunities. And so I think, you know, I, I think there's a broader scope to how you can contribute to astronomy in, in society than I think is often thought about. And I, and I encourage people to think think more openly about it and find the ways in which they can contribute if that's really where their passion is. I love it. Um, that is some fantastic advice. Um, any other co-stars want to um, chime in with um, with anything that uh, got spurred for them by, uh, by Scott's ideas? Um. I have a question because I've been thinking about exoplanets and communicating mm -hmm. them a lot recently. So I was going to pick your brain of 
besides just the number of things, like what do you, like what is the most exciting thing about the exoplanet studies for you? Is it finding another earth? Is it just the stress of planets? Like why are they so cool? <laughs> So they're cool because the same reason, this uh, for very similar reasons why the planets in our solar system are cool. So, you know, you, you look at you look at uh, Jupiter and it's got, you know, all this personality. It has these bands, it has the red spot, it has, I don't know, how many hundred moons or something, it has the galaxy <laughs> moons. The, these are all, uh, the, to coin a phrase that uh, another astronomer used, um, it's just so you know, I'm stealing this. Uh, <laughs> planets are places. There are places yeah. that we can imagine going to and we can imagine seeing. The places that are, you know, even the diversity of places that we find in our solar system is is just nothing compared to the diversity of exoplanets that we see. I mean, I helped to discover a planet that is hotter than most stars. Like, who ordered that? You know, and so it's that kind of idea that these are all worlds and places in and of themselves. Uh -oh. I think it's quite exciting. I agree. It's a space to explore where it feels like anything can be possible still, which is a pretty fun place to be in as a scientist. Or anyone, really. If you could, if you could think of a world, it probably exists. Right. <laughs> yeah. I just like to say Mother Nature is more imaginative than we <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Well, um, yeah, thanks for that, um, that question, Laura, and, and thanks for that um, response, Scott. Um, yeah, I am, I am really looking forward to the, uh, the Roman telescope being launched and, yeah, seeing the, the full uh, diversity of exosolar planets that uh, get discovered um, through that technology. I think it's going to be some very, very exciting times um, in the field of astronomy in the next, uh, next uh, five or ten years. Um, well, again, um, Scott, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We, we really appreciate it. Um, uh, Maggie, our operations director, will uh, reach out to you for the thank you gift. So again, thanks for your time. Um, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, as always, thanks to the co-stars for being here. Um, wouldn't have a show without you. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, all the folks behind the scenes, uh, Maggie, our operations director, um, Yamaka, um, who's helping to uh, put all the slide deck and everything else together for the show. Um, all the uh, Wyoming Stargazing Board of Directors and all of our donors and all of you watching at home. Um, really appreciate you tuning in. And uh, those of you who watch the recording of this show later on, uh, we hope you enjoy it and uh, get inspired. And maybe you'll be in the next generation of astrophysicists as well. Um, hope you join us again in a couple weeks. Uh, but until then, be well, and don't forget to look up. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>